In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, I feel it in this place. Come on, I feel him in this place. How long has it been since you left an apostolic service? Sweaty, your hair all messed up, tie all turned around, shirt tucked out. Come on. He inhabits our praises. He ought to almost shut Luke 22, 55 through 61. It's great to be here. We, we love your pastor and his family. Had a great time. I'm just excited about what God's going to do now. Come on, I feel him in this place. Come on, this is how blind eyes get open right here. Come on, this is how people come out of wheelchairs. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him. And as he sat by the fire and said, this man was also with him. And he denied him saying, woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. See, people were saying man way before the 60s, weren't they? <laughs> so you're all right. And about the space of one hour after another, Confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. I was going to preach a little bit on praise, but I feel like the Lord's telling me that somebody needs to hear that he's the God of second chances and that he loves you and that he cares for you. Even in your worst moment, he still died for you. Let's lift our hands and begin to praise him one more time. Lord, I need you right now. I'm asking you to anoint me like I've never been anointed before, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I rebuke a spirit of condemnation and replace it with a spirit of conviction right now. Fall on this place. Lord, let the gifts of the Spirit begin to operate in this place. I come against any spirit that's not of you, Lord, right now in Jesus' name. I take dominion over any spirit that's not of you right now in Jesus' name. And now I loose you, God, to heal us. Lord, I loose you to change us. Lord, I loose you to fill us, Lord, in your name, Jesus. You may be seated. You see, it's just hours before the fate of all mankind was about to be changed. Because the very same God that had spoken the world into existence, the same God that had called Abraham out of a land of false gods and idols, the same God that spoke to Moses through the burning bush and would deliver the children of Israel out of bondage, was the very same God that robed himself in flesh, stepped into humanity, and was born of a virgin in a manger in Bethlehem, and now he was about to become the sacrificial lamb that would take away the sins of this world. You see, the eyes that saw Satan fall like lightning looked at Peter and told him that before the day was over that you will deny me three times. Now we see Peter as he sits warming his hands by the fire. You see, things are rushing through his mind, not knowing what was going on. All he knew was that the soldiers from the Sanhedrin 
had come into the garden where they were praying. And with the help of one of their own, Judas had come and taken Jesus away. Now with shouts of heresy and blasphemy, they have knocked him to the ground and bound him. And now they lead him away. You see, not only was Peter afraid for the life of Jesus, but in a fit of rage, he had pulled his sword and in anger had struck out trying to hurt them and cut off the ear of one of the accusers. Now he sits here with fear gripping his heart because he can hear him in the nearby courts as they begin to shout angry, with angry and hateful voices, accusing his beloved Jesus of things that Peter knew that wasn't true because he knew the love and compassion of this man because he had seen the blinded eyes open. He had watched as he unstopped the deaf ears he had even seen Jesus raise the dead, and he knew that this man wasn't guilty of heresy or blasphemy. He knew that this was the Christ. He knew that this was the Son of the living God. He had seen Jesus walk on water, and when Jesus beckoned him, he had even stepped out of the boat and began to walk for a moment himself. He knew who this was. He knew that this was the Messiah that had been prophesied about, and if they only realized who he was, they would beg for forgiveness and let him go. Then Peter hears, guilty, and one by one, he can hear the slaps ring out as they walk up and spit in Jesus' face and slap him. Seventy of them, one after the other, and Peter knew that they were bloodthirsty and would only be happy if they took Jesus' life. Then someone comes up beside him and says, you're one of them. I seen you with Jesus. Peter's heart begins to pound as fear begins to well up inside of him. He begins to think if they realize that I was with him, what are they going to do to me? So he denies knowing Jesus and he moves to another place around the fire. Someone then asks again, are you sure you're not one of them because you look like them? And again with fear gripping him, Peter denies him for the second time. He moves to another place around the fire, stretching his hands out to warn them. Someone says, but you are one of them. Your speech betrays you. Finally scared and enraged, he begins cursing and denies Jesus for the third time. At that moment, the crowd burst out of the accusation hall, pushing Jesus ahead of them. His face is swollen, and it's their spit covering his face. And as the cock begins to crow, the word says he looks across the courtyard and by the fire, and his eyes meet Peter's. Realizing what he has now done, Peter begins to run as fast as he can. He's weeping and crying, and now it's not fear, but it's with a broken heart because he has looked into the eyes of his master at the moment that he has denied him, the next morning, he begins to hear the rumors. Peter, have you heard? They found Judas hanging in a field. Peter begins to wonder what is going on, what is happening. Someone else comes up. Peter, have you heard? They scourged Jesus. Then the next thing he hears, Peter, they have crucified him. He has died on the cross. So back to Galilee, the only thing that he knows how to do, he goes back to his boat and he goes to fish. You see, Peter is not the first. Down through the ages, the devil has made many a man and many a woman fall. His only desire is to make you blinded by the things of this world and to be lulled into a place where you forget about the things that God has done for you. Because now all you can see is darkness. You don't see the light anymore because slowly but surely you have been blinded by the devil. But you see what Peter didn't realize was Jesus wasn't looking at Peter with hurt. Jesus was looking at Peter because he knew in just a few short weeks this would be the man that would preach the first message of this church and that he would soon be taking the keys given to him in heaven and unlocking the door of this Acts 2.38 message. 
He knew that this man was going to be a catalyst to the greatest revival that the world would ever see. You see, even though Peter was warming his hands by the fire of doubt and fear, even though he was denying Jesus and cursing him, God seen who Peter was supposed to be. The Lord doesn't look at you and see your shortcomings. The Lord doesn't look at you and see your weaknesses. But God sees who he has created you to be. God created you to be a soul winner. God created you to be a worshiper. The devil wants you to think all that God sees is your faults, but God doesn't look at us like that. God didn't look down and see Nick Mahaney as a drug addict. God looked down and seen me as a preacher, as a man of God. God wants you to know today he's the God of second chances. And if you will just be broken in front of him, he will restore you. He will put you back to what he created you to be. We've got to learn to find a place where we fall at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how many songs you sang up here. You're not going to make it until you learn how to repent. Until you realize that you are just flesh and your flesh is going to fall. But you know what? When you fall, you fall at the cross, at the feet of the God of second chances. You see, the price has already been paid. Come on. You can't get good enough. There's not enough that you can do to deserve him. But he loved you enough. He died at Calvary, the God of second chances. You see, from Eden's forbidden fruit to 21st century politics, people's choices have always been self-centered. God created us in his image to be like him. You know what that means? We need to love what he loves. Come on. Guess what? We need to hate what he hates. We need to be burdened with what burdens him. Our heart needs to beat with his heart. Come on. He chose us. He brought us out of sin and saved us. I got news for you. He didn't bring me this far to leave me or forsake me. He wants you to know that if you'll learn to plead his blood and ask for forgiveness, get up, dust yourself off, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It doesn't say resist the devil and hide from him in fear. It doesn't say resist the devil and not be afraid to even breathe, but it says resist him and he will flee from us. We're not like the church up the street. Come on. We're one God, apostolic, tongue talking, baptized in Jesus' name, Holy Ghost filled. We know Jesus in the second person in the Trinity, but we know that who here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I know who he is. I know what he has done. You see... Satan never tells the drunkard how bad he's going to feel the next morning. Come on, anybody used to feel like that every morning? Huh? He never tells the drug user about the hopelessness and the bondage of addiction or about drug overdose. 
He doesn't tell the fornicator or the adulterer about unwanted pregnancies or diseases or broken homes. Come on, he only shows the fun and beauty of sin for a season. But I got news for him. I've got a God whose name is Jesus. He reached down into the depths of sin when nobody else wanted Nick Mahaney. He said, you know what? I love him enough that I'm going to die for him. And he reached down, pulled me out of sin, and he set my feet on a solid rock. You see, the devil has one goal. That's it. He's got one goal. He wants to see you lost. He wants to see you lost. Come on, he wants to see you lost. He wants your family to be lost. Come on. I'm going to tell you something. The devil knows he's not going to get Nick Mahaney back at the crack house. He's already tried, okay? He knows I'm not going to the bar. So you know what that slimy rascal does? He tries to ease around and get at my family. Come on. He says, well, you know, I know how I'm going to hurt him. I'm coming after his family. I got news for you, devil. I got dominion over you. You better get your hands off of my children. You better get your hands off of my family because I come at you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. You don't have dominion over me. I have dominion over you. The Lord told us we have power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. Come on, the serpent bites you with a head. The scorpion bites you with a tail. So that means any way he comes after me, I've got power over him. You can try anything you want, devil, because no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. It's time we realize who we are. Come on. It's time we realize who we are. One God. Jesus' name. We got dominion over sickness and diseases. Come on. We got dominion over devils. The devil hates us. I got news for him. I'm not real fond of that dude either. You know why he hates us so much? He fell one time. One mistake. One time. He's done. He's out. But he looks at Nick Mahaney. He goes, that fat rascal. He stuck needles in his arms. He went to jail more times than Otis a drunk on Mayberry. I don't know if y'all know who that is. but And every time he slips in his mind, come on, the devil ever come after you men in your mind? Come on, he's trying to attack us through pornography. Come on, through lust of our eyes. Come on, God needs some men to stand up in this last day and say, you know what? I'm going to lift pure and holy hands in the sanctuary. Devil, get away from me in my mind. Get your hands off of me. He needs some men to stand up strong and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I was raised on the evangelistic field. Some of y'all knew my dad. Little quiet, skinny guy. My dad had so many tattoos, he said that when they ran out of stuff to read in jail, they read him. Had those mean little beady eyes. Face looked like it caught on fire and they put it out with a golf shoe. He'd whoop me if he was here right now. My father's the only man that I know that I watched in a church service walk down to a man that was born blind, didn't have the things in his head to be able to see, nothing. 
Man was 50 years old. 1978, El Dorado, Arkansas. He walked over and said, I speak the word of faith. Be healed in Jesus' name. This man jumps up and begins to scream. I can see. I can see. You see, in an instant, God reached down and created everything this fella needed in his head to see. Come on. And God healed him. My dad was crazy. If you look up crazy in the dictionary, there's going to be his face. He went, we went to Pittsburgh, Kansas to start a church when I was just a young boy. And this is predominantly a Catholic town, about 80%. And they didn't like some little fat evangelist preacher coming in there to start a church. We were driving around the town, you know, getting the lay of the land. Y'all remember back then, the kids just stood up in the cars? We didn't have car seats. Y'all loved us so much. <laughs> Boy, don't stand in the back seat. Get up front. <laughs> just push that seat belt down in the, under the seat. Y'all remember, don't you? We were driving around, and we come to this huge church. It was called the Trinity Full Gospel Church. And catty corner to the church was this park. And there looked like two, two or three hundred people coming from this park. It looked like they had dinner on the ground or something, and they were coming back to church. So they're filing in front of our car. And this man made this first mistake. He ran up to my dad's window, and he said, Excuse me, are you our guest speaker? My dad said, I sure am. <laughs> Mistake number two, they led us into the church. We had never been in a church like this. It was beautiful, magnificent. Had theater seating. They set us right on the front row. And they handed my dad the mic. Mistake number three. He walked up there and he told him the name brand of his suit, name brand of his tie, <clears throat> name brand of his shirt, what name brand his socks were and his shoes. He said, everything I own has a name on it or it's bootleg. He said, if you got a baptism that doesn't have a name on it, you got a bootleg baptism. Well, that went over like a pork chop at a bar mitzvah. <laughs> and just as quick as they ushered us in, guess what? <laughs> but there was two families in there that had been, God had revealed Jesus' name baptism to. When we walked out, they walked out. So my father began to work building a church there. Then I... The last three years of his life, I was privileged. I got to travel with him, and I picked his brain about a lot of things. And I asked him about being an evangelist. And he said, well, I was at the church praying. It was after everybody had gone one Sunday night, and an audible voice spoke to me. Told me to look up. He said, when I looked up, I was off in another dimension walking down a path. And he said, I could hear in the distance people screaming and crying out. He said, the further I got down this path, I could feel heat like a furnace blasting me. And he said, I could hear people screaming and being tortured. He said, I went and I looked over the edge of this pit and people were falling and spinning and screaming in hell. He said, the Lord spoke to him and said, look across this pit. And my dad said, he looked across and there was a multitude of thousands of people that he couldn't even put a number on. He said, what stood out was the Lord told me to look at their face. And my dad said, I could see each feature in everybody's face that I looked in. He said, God spoke to me and said, if you don't evangelize, their blood's going to be on your hands. So he went back home, had a dream that night. I, had a, I have a twin brother and sister. They were born on my second birthday. Yeah, that was a bummer of a birthday. <laughs> I mean, we were already in home missions. I didn't get nothing as it was. 
to bring me two little crying babies on my birthday? So we all three had the same birthday. My dad said it was because of his oneness, but y'all figured it out. When we was little, we'd travel and sing with him. He'd call us Charlie's Angels. So, But he had a dream that night. My mother was rocking my brother and sister, and they were dead. And in that dream, he walked up and said, what happened? She pointed at him and said, you wouldn't evangelize. So my dad prayed immediately and said, Lord, if this is of you, show my wife. This is how God works. Before the day could break, God had given my mother the exact same dream. She shook my dad and said, look, we got to evangelize. Well, didn't take us long to pack. And my dad had read that all evangelists need a trailer. So y'all have seen them little teardrop trailers? Oh, yeah. That's what he come pulling up in the yard with. No bathroom. Five of us, all right? And to pull it, we had a 1965 Buick Wildcat. The front of it went all the way to the street. This car had an emblem on it, but you needed binoculars to even find the emblem. It was such a long car. You'd be driving down the road, and we'd make a right-hand turn, and all the doors would fly open. Now, us Mahaney men, we're not fixer-uppers. We're demolishers, okay? So this car didn't have taillights. So my dad got the bright idea. He had run wires from the battery to the driver's side, then wires from the taillights to the driver's side. When us kids would see the cops, we'd say, police, and my dad would rub the wires together. <laughs> taillights. Now, my favorite feature, every time you made a left-hand turn, the horn would honk. It seemed like every revival we went to, guess which way we turned in? Honk! I can't tell you the prayer meetings me and my brother and sister had in the floorboard of that car. God, take this car. I'm, I'm telling you, fervent prayer. If we'd have had a visitor, we'd have had an altar service. That's how much prayer we was having. We was in Wharton, Texas. My dad was preaching an outdoor service. He just stopped, got this, you know, he, he wasn't a man that was speechless a lot, all right? He, he had this shocked look on his face, so everybody turned around and looked, and our car was on fire out there. God had finally taken it in a sacrifice. And if you looked on the front row, you'd see the Mahaney kids. So you can't make this stuff up. God began to use my father greatly. We were in a church in Louisiana. There was a boy sitting there that everybody, this is one of those small towns where if you have a flat in an hour, half the town's there to help you. And everybody in this town knew this boy. He was 16, 17 years old. Had never moved his neck, his arms, his legs, nothing. He was confined to a wheelchair. And I watched as my dad went down during the song service. He laid his hands on that boy and began to pray. Nothing happened. He walked back, everybody looking at him, about like y'all looking at me right now. But in about 10 minutes, all of a sudden, that boy stuck his hand out like this. He began to wiggle his fingers. In about another 10 minutes, he stuck out his other hand. It looked like somebody took a hand and snapped his back into place. By the end of that service, he was standing behind that wheelchair, his legs shaking. He'd never walked before. He didn't know what was going on, you know. They went to the buffet that evening after church. Thank God for buffets. Paul buffeted his body. I buffet mine. And everybody at the restaurant seen him walk in. Let me tell you, Sunday night, you couldn't get within a half mile of that church. Cars were parked from all over that town. There were so many people out in the yard, they had to open up the windows. 
Come on, you let somebody that's blind walk out of this church, go back to their family and say, hey, look what happened to me at the Pentecostals. Hey, look what happened to me at the Pentecostals of Greensboro. You let somebody push that wheelchair out of this church. Where are you going to put them? They're going to be lined up all the way around this place because when the miracle signs and wonders start happening, revival's going to start happening. Come on, it's about to take place in America. You better hang on because God's about to show us who he really is. He's still the blind eye opener. He's still the deaf ear unstopper. He's still the cancer remover. He's still the diabetes take care of her. I've been praying for people. I was praying for people and they weren't getting healed. And I was like, dear God, what's going on? They don't have any faith. The Lord spoke to me and said, Eutychus that fell out of the window when Paul was preaching, he had zero faith. It was Paul's faith that raised him up. Come on, you want the miracles? Build your faith up. Quit worrying about everybody else and say, you know what? They're going to be healed because these signs shall follow them that believe. At the age of 17, when it became my choice, I was like Peter and I rejected him. By the time I was 18, I was an alcoholic. By the time I was 19, I'd smoked my first crack rock. Before I was 20 years old, I'd put the first needle in my arm. You see, I didn't acknowledge him after seeing the countless people filled with the Holy Ghost. After seeing, I can't count all the demons my father cast out of people. I couldn't even stand here and begin to tell you all the miracles that I've seen in his ministry when I was a young boy. People baptized in Jesus' name. But faced with my own decision, what choice would I make? Because I want somebody in this place to know if you're not here there today, you're going to be there soon because there's going to come a time when you will have to choose. Do I serve him or do I deny him? Because there is no middle road. You either choose to reject him or you choose to serve him. Spiraling out of control. I began a journey into life without Jesus. Alcohol, drugs, the crimes that come with the, the, the way of life that I live. Instead of doing what I was dedicated to do as a baby, I chose sin. You see, there's pleasure in sin for a season. So at first, it was just one big party after another. No cares in this world except where I was going to go party at that night or how I was going to get drunk that night or high that night. Faster and faster and faster, my life began going down. Losing jobs, families, in and out of jails, one crisis after another. Even though sin looked good and fun and glamorous, the end result was heartache, pain, destruction, and untimely death. Arrested for 12 class Y felonies, facing 40 to life in prison. Hey, guess what? The party was over now. Like a man drowning, going up and down, fighting for my breath. I reached up for the far-reaching hand of Jesus Christ. He heard my cry. And the God of second chances reached down into Serenity Park Drug Heat Rehab. Picked me up. Covered me with his blood. He forgave me. He cleansed me. He filled me with the Holy Ghost. Now I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. All of the old things have passed away. Everything has become new. That bigot, that racist, that drug addict, that man addicted to alcohol and pornography was now dead. New man, Nick Mahaney, child of God, evangelist, preacher of the gospel. Because you know why? Because I met the God of second chances. Don't walk out of here like you came in this place. He's here today. He's here right now. I don't care what you did this morning. I care about right here, right now. 
Let's stand to our feet. Let me tell you what the Holy Ghost is speaking to me. I'm talking to a young man in this place. Come on, you've been dabbling with things you shouldn't have been dabbling with. You've been looking and going to places. Nobody knows you think where you're going. But Jesus has watched you the whole time. This service is just for you, young man. Come on, the God of second chances has his nail-scarred hands reaching out to you. He's asking you, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. I'm going to give you rest. Come on, young lady. Don't worry about all the things and the doubts that's going through your mind right now. Turn them over to the cross. Turn them over to Jesus. The God of second chances is waiting to take his loving arms, pull you in close to him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. From the moment you walked in this place, He looked down to the heavenlies. He said, I don't care. They may not accept you. Your family may have turned their back against you. It may seem hopeless and lost. But I love you. I died for you. You thought I was worth saving. So you came to a cross and you died. You know, he could have picked all these other people. There's a lot more talented people, a lot better preachers. There's a lot younger men. But he looked down and he saw me. He saw me, Pastor. I believe tears were running in his eyes as he hung there on that cross. And he looked down through the ages. He said, oh, Father, let this cup pass from me. But if I don't do this, Nick Mahaney doesn't have a chance. If I don't die, Glenn Alicio has no hope, no chance. He's seen you. Through all your sin and all your corruptness, through all your hatred. But you know what? He didn't care. He thought you was worth saving. He did. He's seen the times that I denied him. You know, I came home from to Christmas one time. My mom was walking on her deck crying, had her Bible. I thought something had happened. I said, what has happened? She said, oh, I've been praying for you. Those demons that I had inside of me couldn't take it. And I began to curse her. And I walked out in the yard and I pointed to the sky and I began to curse God. And I said, see, he's powerless. He didn't care one bit about that. The moment I said, Jesus, forgive me. Come here, son. I've been waiting on you. I've been waiting on you. He's seen you walk in this place. When you walk through those doors, you know what he said? Come on, I've been waiting on you. Where you been? Come on, I've been waiting on you. You know how important you are to me? I went to a cross. I died and I shed my blood so you could walk out of here free. Come on, young person. He's been waiting on you. Come on, young man. You feel a call of God on your life and you're running from it. So you're doing everything you can to not hear his voice. He's looking over the heavens right now saying, I've been waiting on you. Where you been? I died for you. I wonder if we could start coming to the front. Come on. Come on, grab somebody by the hand. You know, it's not all about the preacher. Sometimes you just got to grab somebody by the hand and say, come on to the cross with me. Come on, he's waiting on you. Come on, that's it. Come on, come to the front. Lord, help us. In the name of Jesus. Come on, I'm pulling for somebody in this place right now. I feel it. I feel the burning. I feel it. I feel it on my shoulders. Dear God, let him walk down here. He's waiting on you. He's looking. He's looking through eyes that had blood in them. He's looking. He's looking down through the ages. And he's got his nail-scarred hands out saying, come unto me. Come unto me. Come on, as we, as we all lift our hands, come on, everybody in this altar, lift your hands right now. 
Let's all begin to repent. Begin to ask God to forgive us of our sins. God, forgive me, Lord. Lord, I need you to forgive me of my sins. Come on. Come on, pour your heart out to him. Dear God, I need you. You've been waiting on me, Jesus. I need you right now, Lord, more than I've ever needed you before. Come on, tell him. Lord, more than I've ever needed you in my life. I don't want to walk out of here carrying all this burden. I don't want to walk out of here carrying this sin anymore. Come on, prayer warriors. Come on. These signs will follow them. Come on, be led of the Holy Ghost. Come on, find somebody. Begin to pray with them. These signs will follow them. Come on. Show somebody. Show them what it means to repent, man of God. Come on, woman of God. Show them what it means to repent. Repent.